Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. This is our uh, weekly half hour program in which we discuss the day's issues or the week's issues or the year's issues from a progressive populist perspective. Our guest today is Mark Kohler. Uh, he is a recent transplant to Oregon and has added his progressive voice to the political discussions here in the state. Uh, and he has expressed an interest in running for office in 2018, so that's exciting. So welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you very much, appreciate your time. Yeah, good, yeah, I'm glad you're here. Uh, tell us about um, your history. Where, where have you been, why did you move to Oregon? Yeah, I grew up uh, in New York. Uh, went to college in New York and California and then uh, raised my family in Massachusetts. Uh, moved here about five years ago for a position with a company out in Hillsboro. <clears throat> about two years ago they sold the business and uh, at my age it was sort of the time to think about doing something else with my life. And uh, so as I got involved in thinking about things that I'd always cared a lot about, it seemed that this was an opportunity to really get involved in uh, the political discussion. Um, I'm definitely a, I was one of the people at Bernie Sanders' first big uh, event here at the Moda Center. And, oh, yeah. uh, um, and I've been a fan of, the, when you think about it, um, the progressive kind of agenda most of my life. Um, I, as we all, we remember, uh, I was a Vietnam War protester in those days, and, mm -hmm. uh, but a lifelong Democrat up until the last, you know, few years where I really started thinking more about, you know, what really needs to change in this country. And as long as we continue to have the, as Nader puts it, the, the business party running things, mm -hmm. um, it made sense to look into the alternatives, and that's actually when I met you. And I learned more about the Progressive Party in, here in Oregon and uh, decided that it's something I want to spend my time and effort uh, trying to make some changes. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, when uh, Ralph Nader talked about the about the business party, he was talking about the Democrats and the Republicans yes. as being two heads of a single party. Yep. Uh, and and then we have all these minor parties like the Oregon Progressive Party that uh, are trying to make some kind of alternative uh, to that. So, what what uh, about the Oregon Progressive Party's um, positions do you particularly feel attracted to? There's a, like you said, there's there's just a lot of there's a lot of issues. There are a lot of things that concern me as an individual and a lot of people. And um, in particular, I look at the healthcare issue as one in, in particular that I care deeply about. Um, the single payer option as a as the alternative that makes the most sense. Um, I look. So, yeah. I'm sorry. So s single payer is universal affordable health care for everybody. Yeah, essentially Medicare for all. Uh, and, right, uh, and I, leaving the insurance companies out of it. Yeah, that's the part of the agenda that continues to drive me a little nuts is, um, you know, that we, anybody who's been listening to the news, you know, there's all this debate about Obamacare and the, you know, the Republican alternatives and those kinds of things, but both of the options are still the insurance companies. I don't think they really care which option as long as they're still running the show. Yes. You know, when you think about um, the rise of premiums and how much people are paying insurance premiums and affordability of insurance premiums, it's like, that's the wrong discussion. The discussion is why do we have insurance companies running the system anyway? Um, I recently became a, you know, one of the lucky people who's on Medicare now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, re I pay, you know, uh, uh, comes out of my Social Security and it's a standard fee and if everyone were paying into the same system um, and the government knows how to do it very well, and to expand that to basically that becomes, in my mind, universal health care. And it's just an agenda that uh, whose time has come. And I think we need people in the political arena who are willing to fight for those kinds of things, who are not indebted to, uh, you know, the corporate interests. Mm -hmm. And that's what also attracted me a lot to the Progressive Party is that, you know, we're, you know, that party is not, how do I put it nicely, you know, not controlled by the corporate entities and controlled by the big donors and controlled, you know, it's one of the things when I listen to, I hate to keep bringing up Bernie Sanders, but when you listen to his, his, his appeal, he and, you know, made it very clear that we'd really, if we're going to change things, we really need to change the, 
not only the discussion, but the way in which politics is run, the way in which people are being elected and who we're kind of electing. And uh, as you were alluding to, yes, Ralph, it, it is. It's two sides of the same. I looked at the last 16 years where we had eight years of Bush and eight years of Obama. And during that whole 16-year period of time, even though we had one versus the other, we still had the corporations running the process. Mm -hmm. We still had the insurance companies running health care. We still have the big donors. Doesn't matter which billionaire you're getting the money from. Um, and you know the poor continue to get poorer. The rich continue to get richer. Mm -hmm. um, we continue to fight these wars, um, you know, in different ways and different you know scenarios. But um, you know that whole definition of insanity. If you keep doing the same things over and over again, expect change. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's time to, in, in order to really make a change, we really need to change the people who are in the government. Mm -hmm. And I know how hard that is. Um, I'm not diminishing the, the challenges of going against the established political parties. Um, but I believe, uh, I don't know if you want me to get into this part of the discussion, but yeah, go, um, go for it. I'm actually uh, taking over, if the people may know, from, from you in terms <laughs> of being yeah. the Progressive Party candidate for 3rd Congressional District. Um, here in Oregon, going yes against right. uh, mm -hmm. a well entrenched and very well liked in a lot of ways incumbent mm -hmm. Democrat, who has essentially run unopposed really in, in any terms of significant opposition. Mm -hmm. I know that you you did you know you got seven percent of the vote I believe last yeah, time yeah. and uh -huh, right. um, but but I didn't really run a campaign so right when that's right, yeah. that's the challenge uh, yes um, I think there's a, a huge uh, opportunity in this particular third district. Uh, the demographics of our district, the incredible activism that's here, uh, most of it focused on local issues, all lots of good stuff, you know. Um, so you you have uh, not said his name. So say Earl Earl Blumenauer. Blumenauer, Representative yes. Earl Blumenauer is the representative from the third district here in Oregon. Right. Yeah, and he and he, I went to his town hall meeting a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. and uh, he packed the room with. Um, you know, older white Democrats, I don't know how else to put that, mm -hmm. and they are very supportive of him. Um, but when you talk to people individually, and you look and you say, well, you know, there are still problems that aren't being addressed. And what more should the Democratic Party be doing, or the Democratic incumbent be doing on those issues that people are really starting to care about? Um, the health care issues, and the homelessness issues, and the and um, the immigration issues, and the defense and you know industry running the show, and the billionaires and the Citizens United, and all those issues that we could, I mean, you could do a separate show on every one of those. Every one, yes. You uh -huh. know, um, but yet they just, you know, he's just part of the, you know, they they rate congressmen by, um, you know, how liberal they are, mm -hmm. and I guess he's listed as the 57th most liberal. Um, that means there's 56 more congressmen that are considered more liberal than he is. But even their liberal, their liberal, uh, you know, the way they assess that, isn't really dealing with the agenda that we really care about. That the, you know, so it's a, I think it's a, a very interesting opportunity. Um, I look at it not as a um, trying to criticize him as much as being sort of like, where do we go from there? Mm -hmm. You know, what's the next step? I'm not gonna, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be. A Republican will not get elected in this district. Uh, no. So we're not really saying, well, you know, you can't run an independent candidate because then you'll open up the opportunity for a Republican to take the seat. Well, that isn't going to happen. No. So is there really an alternative to what has been going on? And um, you know, um, again, you know, he he's not. I don't think he's the person that that we really need right now in Congress. Right. I yeah. think we really need someone who's really willing to. To stand up and fight for the things that I think most of the people here, a good percentage of people, really care about. Okay, so if you ran against, you would not run in the primary. You would run as a Progressive Party candidate. Yes, and also I would run in the Independent Party primary. Um, so my my hope is to be the candidate for Progressive, Independent, and um, potentially Green Party as well. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to talk to the Working Families Party as well and some of the other, get endorsements from as many of these groups as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think with a coalition of, of all those various kinds of groups, 
um, there is a real opportunity. I know a lot of people have said to me, you know, you know, you, it's ridiculous to run against him because you can't win. And I said, well, you know, that's what they said about Donald. I hate to put it that way, oh, but that's true. You yes. know, right. here's a guy that, what right did he? Have? You know, we can talk forever about the problems of Donald, yeah. but, <laughs> but I mean, it, it, it is an opportunity now. The country is has been sensitized, I think, um, to really care about issues now that they, you know, they see a government now that is going to destroy our public schools. Mm -hmm. Look at who we have in terms of our Department of Education. Mm -hmm. We have an EPA head who doesn't believe in global warming. Mm -hmm. We have a, a group of, I, I call it white supremacists almost, in, in, you know, in the ear of the President of the United States. Mm -hmm. We have generals in, in all these capacities now. You know, it's, it's a scary time the way the government is going. It, and, it, it, yeah. at, the, at the federal level, it certainly yeah. is a, a government of billionaires and generals. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, this, I, I, again, we could, we could probably tear down almost every one of those, you know, the cabinet positions that he's in there. But, you know, so what effect do we really have? You know, you know people say all politics is local. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are certainly, there are local issues. We have a, um, a spiraling uh, housing pri problem here in, in, in Portland. The cost of housing, homeless problem continues to be a big problem. Um, we have very low graduation rates in our high schools. Our educational system is under wrap. You know, our bridges are falling down. The bottles are everywhere. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of local issues, and I think it's great that there are lots of activists here in this area who are working really hard on those local issues. But I think we, in addition, we, you know, we got to step up and and get some people into the federal game who are just as active and just as concerned as, as the local people are on the local issues. Because Congress does one major thing, they spend money. Mm -hmm. And that's the only effect we can really have, I think, in terms of changing the course of what's happening in our federal government is if we can get people who can influence the way allocations you know, and appropriations are actually made. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. you, if you ran against Earl Blumenauer and he won, yes. you would be one of, was it 530 representatives? Well, you know, if you look at what, it's interesting, if you look at what just happened in terms of the defeat of the repeal of Obamacare, it was 20 Republicans who mm -hmm. killed that, not the Democrats. Democrats just sort of sat on the sideline and watched the Republicans kill it themselves. It was a very small group of people. And I think if the Congress were to be able to elect maybe 20 ind truly independent progressives mm -hmm. into the Congress, and you now have a block who can, when, you know, can, you have a lot of influence as a relatively small block of people who, like, you know, in the same way the Black Caucus works in the Congress, where they are able to use their influence on those sort of civil rights types issues. Um, and I think the Congress is ready for a more, um, diverse group of people being elected. I know there are a lot of organizations um, right now that, you know, the one for, that I think of right away is, you know, changethecongress.org. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a lot of activity, if you look online, about trying to get an, a different type of individual elected to Congress, someone who is not beholding uh, upon, whether it's PACs or it's, you know, donors or other kinds of interest groups, people who are really dedicated to what I believe our government is supposed to do is to serve the people, mm -hmm. not to serve the corporations, not to serve the donors, not to serve the military, not to serve the insurance companies, not to serve the drug companies, yeah, yeah. but to serve the people. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it, the only way you're gonna do that is people who are truly independent of those organizations and controls. Mm -hmm. um, not to diminish the challenge by any stretch, um, you know, talking to you and you know, hopefully reaching out to some other people yeah. out in the, in the audience to start to get them to realize that you know, there is a real opportunity to do that. We don't have to just, you know, protect against Republicans, mm -hmm. you know, in this district. Um, we can do more than that. Mm -hmm. it, it has Earl Blumenauer, well, re, it actually would surprise me uh, that you said he's ranked 57th uh, on, the, on the liberal scale mm -hmm. and, that, uh, and that there are 56 56 more right that are considered more who liberal. are considered more liberal in in Congress right uh, th that really surprises me in, in part because you know I followed him and he generally takes pretty liberal positions mm -hmm. although there have been some times when it's like well he could take more liberal positions or be more out front more of a leader on on things than what he has been 
Well, you remember, he was a proponent of TPP. Yes, you know, and of course was, that's why I ran against him. Right, right. and there were those issues that he, um, I hate to, again, I don't know him personally. I've only mm -hmm. seen him in person once at a town hall. I've tried to see some of the interviews he's had and, and kinds of things, and I think he is, um, you know, he's, he's a party guy. You know, he, he cares about issues that are good for people here, um, but not, but he won't step up and stand out and risk the potential of, you know, uh, being against his own party by stepping out. Mm -hmm. And that's, so it's really, in my mind, it's time to move beyond him, not to say he didn't do good things. I mean, yeah, in compared to a lot of the other people in Congress, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, we're state, our state was very lucky that we have, um, you know, a group of congressmen and senators who, who really do work well, but um, I think it's really time that we, you know, we have to change the makeup of the Congress. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and so you mentioned one organization that is, has that goal, mm -hmm. and how strong are they, or how, how, how widespread are they? It's hard to say, you know, when you go online, I think anybody who has been looking, you know, there are so many, like Bernie Sanders has a group, Our Revolution, which mm -hmm. is also there to support progressive candidates. Um, there are several other organizations like that, change.org, there's, there's all kinds of places where they're, how much of a reach do they have? How much influence are they really gonna have on the, on the next midterm elections? It's hard to say. Um, and I try to stay involved with as many of them as I can to kind of um, reach out to the um, to those organizations because clearly support is going to be critical. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if if indeed we're here to run to to not just to espouse our point of view, but to actually take an opportunity to actually win an election, as mm -hmm. as difficult as that may seem, as high a mountain it is to climb. Um, when you have people, like there's a very active group here called Bernie PDX. Um, it's a bunch of people who worked really hard for Bernie. Um, this was one of the places where he had probably the most supportive he had in almost any city in the country. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of them and they care deeply. And we also have a very large community of younger voters here in this district. Um, I did this kind of a kind of a check on the demographics of the district and about 40% of the voters are between 18 and 35. Mm -hmm. um, that's a pretty big block of folks. We also are the only district that has 5% uh, minority as compared to the other districts that are all less than 2%. In Oregon. In Oregon, mm -hmm. right. Um, and if you think about those groups, you think about the people who are supportive of Sanctuary City, the people who are uh, the Black Lives Matters group and the, the Working Mothers you know, Family group. And you know, there are so many diverse groups of people that if we bring them together um, on essentially what really is a progressive agenda, um, he might be in trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, he might have to, if nothing else, it might move him to be more, I mean, uh, talking to some people about um, what's happening in Congress with a lot of congressmen who've been getting just barraged with phone calls about health care and other things. And, you know, that, that does get them to, to move. So if nothing else, if we don't win the seat, at least maybe we can, you know, really get our local representatives to realize that if they want to stay in their roles, mm -hmm. they've got to they've got to move beyond just the the typical democratic platform. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've talked to some people uh, who are working to try to move the democratic platform to be more progressive, and the answer I hear from other people is, yeah, you'll get a line in the, you know. <laughs> in the platform that they will ignore. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, so yes. is that really where the energy is best used? Um, yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I have certainly known a lot of people who have spent a tremendous amount of time to get things put into Democratic Party platforms mm -hmm. at either local level, state level, or national level. And then, of course, the people who actually get elected uh, as Democrats then uh, ignore those things. It, it's, it uh, is... Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have not spent my time doing that, my, you know, but uh, <laughs> it, it, it's a little frustrating for me to watch people I engage in that. Yeah, that's um, kind of what I, that's the way I look at it and the way I've talked to like a number of these younger people who are, you know, the, what they call them the Bernie Kratz or whatever they call themselves yeah. these mm -hmm. days, but um, that, you know, use your energy in a way that 
you know, and focus on really making some significant change, because I really don't think you can change the Democratic Party. As long as, you know, Pelosi party is still in charge, you know, they just elected a new person to head the DNC, and mm -hmm. it's the same old stuff, mm -hmm. you know. And yeah, they will appeal to the more progressive voters, and they will, you know, their whole agenda is to try to, you know, win back the House um, for the Democrats in two years or a year and a half, and then in four years to defeat Donald. That's their agenda. You know, um, mm -hmm. I think there's issues that are important that aren't being addressed. And uh, so, if if you were elected, what would be the first? I think pigs would fly. Is that the expression? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. If you were, when you are elected, thank you. Let sir, me, thank let you, me put that sir. When you are elected, what would be the first bills that you would sign on as a co-sponsor? Yeah, I think you know, th there's. There are several issues, obviously, and we can look at many of them. But clearly, the I think the, you know, universal health care is the issue that um, we really should put our stamp on and say we must make that happen. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a real. I mean, if you look, it's funny. I was watching a, um, an old interview that Donald Trump did a couple of years ago, where he was actually in favor of it. Mm -hmm. He talked very positively about you know that option. California is probably going to come close, if not pass it this time. Um, Actually, again, because they've already passed it twice. Right, except for, um, except for Arnold. Right. Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> <Vito's>, right, <laughs> That's yes. right. So we hope that Jerry Brown will, will get on board, and that will send clearly the message to politicians around the country that, you know, the most populous state in the country can do it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, this, it's the sixth largest economy in the world. Um, you know, if you take it as a separate economy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's, that's probably the single um, major thing, but I also believe very strongly that we have to focus on education um, in a way that, you know, we have to, we have to change this um, situation. Gresham is a, is a, is a town in, in the third congressional district where half of the minority students don't graduate high school. You know, I mean, that's, that's something we, c we can do, and it's going to take money to fix that. Mm -hmm. And like I said, that's kind of what the Congress can do. We can, we can drive money uh, to help those kinds of situations. Um, the homeless situation here as well, it's going to take resources. We can't just expect, um, you know, uh, soup kitchens, if you will, mm -hmm. you know, to keep people alive on the street. We need to do a lot more than that. It's going to take funds, and it's going to take federal funds to do that. Um, infrastructure, of course, is another thing that you know everybody talks about. Um, but you know, um, and I know that's one of the things that people say about why we should, you know, why they think Earl should stay there because he has seniority and he can, because you have seniority, you can do more things. But you're not doing them. So if you've had all this influence and you're not doing them, mm -hmm. then you know why would you expect it'll be any different moving forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a, a couple of specific things have been in the news recently. Um, uh, President Trump has proposed a $54 billion increase in the military <sighs> budget yep. re reaction. Yep. Well, I, I, that one even doesn't worry me as much as the trillion dollar plan to upgrade the nuclear arsenal. Mm -hmm. The $54 billion increase seems like a drop in the bucket compared to a trillion dollars to upgrade the oh. nuclear arsenal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's that's very worrisome. Um, you know, uh, our and again, we could do just a whole, you know, show just talking about uh, the issues about the way the military. You know, I was I was shocked when, you know, that that situation, that raid that that the uh, the one seal was killed, mm -hmm. um, and they still called it a big success. Well, fourteen women and children were killed. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you how do you call that a success? You know. Oh, because we got some Al Qaeda operatives or some ISIS people, some bad people were killed, but we also killed a lot of innocent women and children. Mm -hmm. You know that process, and what I hear now is, you know, this whole sort of they're taking the, you know, the chains off. They're they're trying to to change the the rules of engagement now. Um, that it's okay to bring back torture. It's okay to expand the use of drones into into neighborhoods where innocence collateral damage can be increased, you know, um, that's a scary proposition. Uh, yeah, and, and of, of course, recently, although it doesn't get any press, is that President uh, Trump, that's really hard to say, <laughs> Pre President, President Trump has increased our military engagement in the Middle East in a number of places. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think there's a real danger of us, you know, being embroiled in another 
ground war before too long. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a scary proposition. But, um, you know, if you don't fund it, you know, um, and remember even during, you know, the, the, the even go back to the Vietnam War and go back to the first Gulf War, you know, if you don't fund the war, they can't do it, mm -hmm. you know. D you know, and uh, Congress has the ability to withhold funding. And uh, so that whole sort of, yes, increase of the... Y yeah. Uh, Peter, uh, Representative DeFazio just introduced some legislation. Um, and I'm sorry that I'm mentioning it and I can't remember the details of it, but it had to do with, with funding wars that are not de which are not declared. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but it was uh, remarkable that this has to be new legislation. Uh, and it was also remarkable, in my mind, and maybe I'm just not giving it enough time, that no other representative in Oregon signed on as a co-sponsor. Mm. Yeah, I don't, I'm not aware of that either, but yeah, that's the kind of things that Congress has to do if we're really going to uh, inhibit this militaristic approach that, you know, the, the group of people that, you know, I mean, think about the guy, Mad Dog. That's, that's who's in charge. Uh, yeah, Mad Dog. <laughs> Mad yeah. Dog. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. I don't want Mad Dog in charge, you know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. I like someone who is, you know, more concerned about, you know, creating a, a more peaceful world. Mm -hmm. uh, someone who is, you know, concerned about, you know, protecting U.S. interests. Yes, I get that. And protecting the United States interests around the world. But that doesn't mean you know, that we have to become more militaristic and more, you know, uh, involved in creating more and more enemies. Mm -hmm. Right, know? yeah. So uh, thank you very much for being here. Oh, Appreciate it's a pleasure. It. Thank All you right. very much for giving me the time. Right. It's yeah. always nice to spend time with you. All right, thank you. Right, yeah, so we've been uh, talking with Mark uh, Kohler, who is uh, running. I, I think you've said you're running. Yes, I am. You are running for sure. Uh, for U.S. Congress in November 2018 against Representative Earl Blumenauer here in the 3rd District. Uh, Mark's been a supporter of Bernie Sanders in the past and is going to run on the Oregon Progressive Party ticket uh, and get support from uh, the Independent Party and the Green Party and, and others, hopefully. Uh, so uh, you've been watching the Alliance for Democracy's Populist Dialogues program. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.